Shalom and welcome back to the Mysteries of the Messiah podcast, The Birth of a Jewish King, Season 1, where we're continuing to explore the birth of Yeshua, Jesus, from a Jewish Hebraic uh, perspective. In this episode, we are going to be looking at the mystery of the virgin birth. And when you think about the virgin birth, of course, the focus is on Mary. But I want to tell you something. Mary, believe it or not, that actually was not her name. That might be shocking, hopefully not scandalous. But her name in Hebrew was actually Miriam. And that's really significant because Miriam was the sister of Moses, and Jesus is a type of Moses. So we're going to see this is significant for the story. So the meaning of Miriam actually comes from the Hebrew word mar, which means bitter. And this makes sense because the Egyptians embittered the lives of the children of Israel in Egypt. And so the fact that Yeshua, Jesus, was born with a mother by the name of Miriam is because he is the greater than Moses. In his day, the Romans were embittering the life of the Israelites, the Jewish people, and he came to redeem and rescue us from the bitterness of sin and death. And also, the word Miriam can come from the word more in Hebrew, which means like myrrh, like the type of aromatic aromatic spice uh, that was used to make incense and just so significant because of the fact that it was used in the incense in the temple, but also it was used to make myrrh oil, which was a symbol of joy. So Miriam was to bear a son who would be born into a world full of bitterness, a world where people were being oppressed, both politically and spiritually. So Miriam's name is a clue. It hints at the virgin birth, that her son would turn the bitter into sweet by tasting the bitterness of death and the consequences of our sin so that we might find joy. Wow. (laughs) There is so much in a name. I want to go deeper into the virgin birth by looking at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 is where we'll begin. It says this, Now the birth of Yeshua the Messiah happened this way, When his mother Miriam was engaged to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, made up his mind to dismiss her secretly. But while he considered these things, behold, an angel of Adonai, an angel of the Lord, appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Take Miriam as your wife, for the child conceived in her womb is from the Ruach HaKodesh, from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call his name Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Wow, so much is going on in this opening chapter of Matthew. But I want us to understand some of the context, some of the seriousness of it, why an angel had to supernaturally intervene. There's more to the story. The first thing we have to understand is that when you were betrothed, it was like you're being married. Uh, The Jewish wedding actually takes place in two parts, the engagement, which is the betrothal, which was actually legally binding as as a marriage. And the only thing that was different is that when you officially got married, the second part, you would consummate the relationship. So to break an engagement was a serious uh, decision, and it actually required a bill of divorce. And if you you suspected your wife or your fiancé of adultery, there was this whole public ceremony that was very shameful and would bring humiliation and could ruin her life, and Joseph didn't want to do that to her. But there was something significant as well, is that according to Jewish halakha, Jewish law, if you divorce your wife— You can never remarry her. So part of the significance of why the angel had to intervene, because if Joseph would have divorced her and then found out later that she was actually a righteous woman, under Jewish law, he couldn't remarry her without breaking it, and Yeshua couldn't have been born breaking the Torah, but he came not to break it, but to fulfill it. So we see all this kind of tension and suspense going on in this opening chapter of Matthew. 
But so there was this scandal, God saved from the scandal because Yeshua had to be born a descendant of David. That's why the angel had to intervene. So let's take a deeper dive into the spiritual and prophetic significance of the virgin birth. And believe it or not, it goes all the way back to the opening chapters of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, man and woman steal from the tree. The curse comes on creation, but in the midst of the curse, there's the promise of blessing. There's hope in the midst of judgment. God comes and says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. That's the woman and the serpent. Between your seed and her seed, he will bruise you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel. So this is the first messianic promise in Genesis 3.15 that there would be a descendant of the woman that would come and destroy the serpent and his seed, undo the curse, and restore the blessing. But here's the interesting thing. There is a clue, there is a hint to the virgin birth that will later be spoken of in Isaiah in Genesis chapter 3, going back to the very beginning. Because here's the thing, women don't carry seed, men carry seed. So it's the seed of Abraham, it is the seed of Jacob, it is the seed of David. But in this passage in Genesis 3, it's the seed of the woman. Well, women are not associated with seed. The significance of that is giving a hint. It's giving us a clue. There is an illusion here that the promised seed of the woman, that this one that would be born from her, is going to have a unique birth that's going to point to his unique identity as the promised seed of the woman, the Messiah. But of course, there is more. The famous passage in Isaiah 714, this is what it says. Then Adonai spoke to Ahaz saying, ask for a sign from the Lord your God. And then it goes on to say this, therefore Adonai himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive when she is giving birth to a son, she shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. The interesting thing is that Isaiah 7 has to be read in the context of Isaiah chapter 9, which says this, For to us a child is born, a son will be given, the government will be upon his shoulders, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and shalom there will be no end, and on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it through justice and righteousness from now until forevermore. Wow. Why is this so significant? Isaiah 9 is giving more clarity, more insight on who this one born of a virgin in Isaiah 7, 14 and ta- is talking about. And what's amazing is that there is another hint or an illusion that strengthens the idea that a virgin birth is being talked about in Isaiah 7 because there's a number of critics and some more liberal-leaning scholars that argue Isaiah 7 is not talking about a virgin birth. It's not talking about a supernatural birth. It's talking about a natural birth in the day of King Ahaz. But when you read it in light of Genesis 3, and when you understand it in light of a hidden clue and mystery in Isaiah 9, we'll see it has to be talking about a virgin. So, There's actually something in Isaiah chapter 9 that's grammatically incorrect. When it says of the increase of his government, there'll be no end. The word in Hebrew is lemar be. That means to increase. The interesting thing there is that in Hebrew, the word mar be begins with the letter mem. It's the letter that we pronounce M in English. And in Hebrew, there's actually two letter mems. There is an open mem, which occurs in the beginning or middle of the word. And there is a closed letter mem that only occurs at the end of the word. Why is that significant? Because the letter mem in Hebraic thought is symbolic of the womb. The interesting thing here is that the letter mem at the beginning of this word uses a closed mem. The letter closed mem can only be used at the end of the word. So in Hebrew, they're breaking the grammatical rules to communicate a message. The one who is going to be the prince of peace of whose government is going to increase and who there is going to be no end 
is going to be born through not an open womb, not a natural birth, but through a closed womb. It's the miracle of the virgin birth that's being alluded to here in the Hebrew of Isaiah chapter 9. That is incredible. It's incredible because think about it. Messiah begins with the letter M. Moses begins with the letter M. Messiah is going to be the greater than Moses. Yeshua's mother is named Miriam or Mary in English. Guess what? Mary or Miriam begins with the letter Mem. So it's all connected to the mem- letter Mem. So it's a clue that points to the mystery of the virgin birth. Amazing. This is what Yeshua was doing on the road to Emmaus, opening up the scriptures and showing these things. But of course, there is more. As we said, the letter Mem is the first letter of Miriam, Yeshua's biological mother, uh, Marias in Greek. Why is that significant? Hebrew is alphanumeric. Greek is alphanumeric as well. Numbers are important. Mary in Greek, Marias, adds up to 352. Why is that significant? What's amazing about that is that Mary gave birth to Jesus in Bethlehem, which has a longitude of 35.20. So the numerical value of Mary's name, Miriam's name in Greek, points to the actual longitude of the city in which she would give birth to the Messiah. But of course, there is more. Yeshua was born as the Passover lamb to be a sacrifice for sin. The Hebrew word for sacrifice is korban. Korban has a numerical value 352. So Messiah was born in Bethlehem connected to 352, the longitude, as a sacrifice, 352. This is amazing. The first people to recognize Yeshua were the shepherds. What's incredible is that the word for lamb in Hebrew and in Greek adds up to, guess what? 352. So Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus was born as the lamb, 352, of God, born to Mary, 352, in Bethlehem, whose longitude is 35.2, and is the one who offered himself as a sacrifice, Korban 352, to atone for our sins that we might be brought near. 352 in Hebrew is brought near. Wow. I think that is amazing. The numbers always blow my mind. It shows the intricacy and the connection of Scripture. What does this mean to us? Listen, Mary's response, think about it for a minute, could have been very different. When Sarah heard that she was supernaturally pregnant in old age, she laughed. When Zechariah, who's going to be the father of John the Baptist, heard that his wife Elizabeth was going to conceive in old age, he laughed. Sarah laughed and doubted. Zechariah laughed and doubted. But Mary's response was not one of doubt. It was not one of fear. It was one of faith. She did not laugh at the promise. She laughed with the promise. Friends, all of us have a decision. God oftentimes makes us these promises, whether in Scripture or to us. Are you going to laugh with, meaning you're going to take it in faith and rejoice, or are you going to laugh at them in unbelief? Hey, friends, we have a special guest today on the show. I am so excited to have Matthew West, singer, songwriter, host of the K-Love Fan Awards. He's one of the most creative guys. He's an amazing guy. He loves the Lord. And uh, I had a great opportunity to meet him at the K-Love Fan Awards a few years ago. And we are so excited to have him today. Matthew, shalom, shalom. Thank you for being here, my friend. Rabbi Jason, great to see you, and thank you for having me on your show. Yeah, thanks for coming. You know, I know that as a singer-songwriter, you grew up as a pastor's kid, and that you have fans send stories to you, and you've written a number of songs off of these stories. You know, what do you find so powerful and meaningful about stories? Yeah, that's been a a real bedrock of my creative process. It's kind of at this point now, it's sort of woven into the into the fiber of and the fabric of of what I do and what I love to do. I think as a young kid, I grew up. My dad's a minister, and 
I have a vivid memory of this uh, addiction recovery program from the inner city of Chicago that would come to my church out in the suburbs. And every few months, as part of their recovery journey, my dad would have this group come and they would they would sing a couple songs and there were these pretty group of rough looking guys. Right. And they would form a choir. I don't know why they did that, but because they weren't very good singers, but then they would take turns sharing their story. I just remember as this little preacher's kid sitting on the front row, there was something different about those Sunday services, the way that those guys got up and shared their story. They weren't like a lot of the people that I knew growing up in church where you know, it wasn't typical for somebody to, to lead with the broken chapters of their story. It was, how are you? I'm fine. You good? I'm good. We're all good. <laughs> and yet these guys were coming from the inner city and they'd had these unbelievable, you know, life transforming moments happen from addiction to recovery, from prison to freedom. And they would get up and say, hey, I want to tell you about my life. It ain't all pretty. And it's not perfect, but let me tell you about a God who is perfect. And there was something about those redemption stories one by one that just impacted me. And here I am all these years later now drawn to the real, authentic, and guess what, flawed stories of all of our lives. Because I think it's in that brokenness where we can really see redemption begin to take place. And then when people hear stories like that, I love to get this front row seat of what happens when somebody hears a story of redemption, they find hope for their own story, which is a real special thing. You know, I love it because something a lot of uh, believers don't know is that, you know, in Jewish tradition, right, Moses goes up on Mount Sinai. Well, according to the scriptures, Moses goes up on Mount Sinai. He gets the first set of the Ten Commandments. He comes back down. He sees the children of Israel committing the sin of the golden calf, and he smashes the tablets. He eventually goes back up the mountain. He comes down with the second set of tablets. But the question is, what happened to the first set of tablets, right? These tablets were written by the hand of God. I mean, they came straight from heaven. And in Jewish tradition, Moses takes the first set of tablets and he places them in the ark with the, the broken tablets in the ark with the whole set of tablets. And it's a reminder that, ho that wholeness comes from brokenness. In this first season of our podcast, Mysteries of the Messiah, we're talking about the birth of uh, the Jewish king, Jesus, Yeshua uh, in Hebrew. And I guess the question that I want to ask you is, you know, when you think about the Christmas story and the birth of the Messiah, is there a story or a part of it that you really love or that really speaks to you as we come into this holiday season? You know, it's it's crazy. So this year, um, during pandemic, of all things, I sat down and I wrote a Christmas song. Oh wow! And I wrote a, song and it's called "The Hope of Christmas." And I and I, I started just revisiting like the Christmases of my youth, and the lyric says, uh, "Take me back to eight years old." Um, my daddy's hand and a, and a, or take me back to eight. I don't even remember the words of my own song. Take me back to eight years old, a little church on a dead end road with a candle flicker in one hand and dad's hand in the other. Wow. Take me back to silent night. My heart was full and the world was right. Cause right now the world looks nothing like those innocent Decembers. These days, peace on earth is hard to find. And I need you to remind me one more time that you're still the hope of Christmas. And I, I think I've been, all wow. that to say, I've been thinking about Christmas all year. Wow. And, and I keep, I don't know why I keep finding myself coming back to Luke chapter two in the middle of July. And uh, usually we, we kind of <laughs> keep certain scriptures or the Christmas yeah. story. And, uh, and, and so, I, you know, I guess I'm not answering your question yet, but I guess I would have to say is throughout my career as a songwriter, one of the things I've loved doing is writing Christmas songs from different vantage points as I, to the best of my ability, right. you know, as I imagine what the story was like, and I can't really pick one favorite thing. I mean, when I think about the struggle that Joseph must have faced in the decisions he had to make and his faithfulness to Mary, the, you know, the, the thoughts that Mary was pondering in her heart. I mean, just the, the, every detail of the story is unbelievable. And what I'm even beginning to understand and talking to you is there's such intricate details, just proof that God is in the details. They always say the devil's in the details. No, no, no. 
God is in the in the details of the story and every ounce of the Christmas story. And the more I learn, I begin to realize that um, this story is for us to find hope, perhaps like never before in the year of 2020, to really extract the hope from what seems like a hopeless year. And uh, so I, I love talking about the Christmas story and I love learning things that I didn't already know. No, I love it. And I think you're, I just love what you're saying because I think the birth of the Messiah, the birth of Yeshua, the birth of Jesus is the birth of hope in the world. I mean, he was born into a dark time in history. In many ways, the first century resembles the time and the day in which we live right now. I really believe there's many more similarities today to that time than maybe any other point in history. But I love it because Uh, he's really the birth of hope. And I think part of this seeing the hope in the story is that when you look at it on the surface, right, you have this megalomaniac, uh, narcissistic Roman emperor that wants to uh, increase his finances so he can have more soldiers and live a lavish lifestyle. And here you have these poor people and these peasants, you know, in the land of Israel under Roman domination. And Mary and Joseph, she's nine months pregnant, right? And she's got to make this trip down to Bethlehem. And it's, a, it's I mean, imagine having to walk 70, 80 miles. I mean, it's crazy or be on, you know, be on a, an animal, whatever. I mean, and they seem like they're pawns. They seem like they're pawns at the whim of this king, and there's nothing they can do about it. But God used the greedy desires of this king to get Joseph and Mary to the city of Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy (laughs) that that he had to be born in Bethlehem, the city of David, right? You, Bethlehem, are frothed too small to be among the clans of Judah. You know, one will go forth from you from Bethlehem to be ruler. So, I mean, God was working behind the scenes and all of these details of prophecy and promises being fulfilled. And that's where I think part of the hope is. Part of the hope is God is in control. Yes. He's in the details. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in the musician's terms, you know, the great orchestrator. You know, sometimes I think when uh, when I'm making music, like there's certain there's certain parts of the music where only I know what this part is leading to, and and maybe and I'll do things in a, when I'm making an album, for example, where there may be a lyrical reference in one song that's tipping the hat to a song later in the album, and there's in other words, what there there are some subtle undertones or connecting ties and I'll, I'll do it intentionally. But in my mind, I go, the average listener is never going to pick up on this. Right. But if they did, it would make the experience (laughs) that much richer. And I, I think about that, even in the moments before we went on the air and you were sharing a detail about the Christmas story that I wonder, and I think about that, like the, just the details that you said, uh, and how you, I, I thought of orchestration right. and the orchestration is just in every little nuance and detail. And I, I pray that every Christmas throughout the rest of my life and for all of us, that we might gain greater insight each year. And that's the way the scripture is for me. You know, I can read the same scripture a thousand times. Yeah. And yet that 1001, I'll open my Bible to the same scripture and God shows me something else in it. There's, and I think that's why, you know, to believe that the word is alive and active. But when it comes to the Christmas story, I, I love what you shared. And I love that the message of hope, I love what you said, the birth of hope. I'm probably going to go write a song now and not give you any credit. <laughs> that's but, okay, man. All's uh, <laughs> fair for the kingdom. <laughs> Thank you again, Matthew, and blessings on you and the family. Thank you, Rabbi Jason. I hope you have a great Christmas too. And uh, and, uh, thank you so much for uh, the work that you do and continue to do. I know it's going to encourage a whole lot of people. All right. Thank you. Be blessed. Shalom. Shalom. The virgin birth is the fulfillment of the Emmanuel prophecy. Emmanuel means God with us. And this is really good news. There is so much fear in the world We're living in crazy times. There's lots of anxiety and fear because things seem so uncertain. But you don't need to live with fear when you know the Lord is near. Knowing God is near is one of the keys to overcoming and dealing with and dispelling fear. Emmanuel, God is with us. 
God has promised to be with you. God has promised to be near. You don't have to you don't have to fear. Yeshua said, "Lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. He died so that you might be brought near, and therefore the Lord is here with you, so do not fear. Emmanuel, God is with us. He is so good. He keeps every one of his promises, even if they seem crazy and outlandish. All we can say at this season is, come, O oh come, Emmanuel. I love talking about the birth of the Messiah like we've been doing in this episode But you know what's better than even talking about it? Going to the actual place where he was born. If this has made the story come alive to you in new ways, I want to encourage you, it will come even more alive if you actually go and see the actual places where the story occurred. So I want to invite you to join me in Israel for a life-changing tour of the Holy Land. I promise, whether it's your first time or you've gone several times We love to study the scriptures from the Hebrew perspective to take you deeper. And it's it's information and connection, but it's also about encounter with God, about encountering Emmanuel, God with us. So if you're interested in coming with me and checking out and getting some more information, you can check it out at rockroadrabbitours.com. But also, we have an amazing partner who we're working with to do these tours and doing this podcast with It's Premier Israel. I want to encourage you to check out their website as well, premierisrael.com. They have some amazing resources about Israel as well. You don't want to miss out on those. And you you can also subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any of the episodes. We've got lots more coming, some more amazing guests. And we're just so blessed Uh, to be doing this and having you participate and be part of it with us. Continue to join us on the journey. Subscribe, share it with your friends. You can get all the information in the show notes, or if you're watching on YouTube, the uh, video version, just click the link below. It's such a blessing to be with you again. Shalom, shalom. Shalom.